All right, you guys ready to get going today? Yeah, we're ready, Y'all all scared. I'm, you're not really scared. I see some of you smiling because you were here at the start of the service when I told you this is going really, to really hit you today now. Um, because it hits everybody. This is, one of those, this is one of those days where when you're preaching through a book, you got the, you got the next verses, all right? You, uh, you know, a lot of times, I don't know if you guys ever do this. I don't know if you've ever said this in your life or if anybody you know ever said this to you. But if you've been in church and the preacher's preaching on something, and maybe your friends know that's you, and they look at you like, okay, he's preaching to you today. Like, he knew you were going to be here, and he developed a whole sermon to talk to you about what you need to do. Uh, people think that sometimes. They do. If, if, you know, if you've been in church long enough, you know, you'll see it one day. I mean, somebody will say something like that. Oh, yeah, he knew you'd be here, Dave. <clears throat> well, when you, preach, right, when you preach through a book, you're just stuck with whatever comes next. I mean, unless you're going to skip it, and then it's obvious that you skipped it, and everybody then wants to know, well, why did he skip it? You know, <laughs> well, maybe it was boring or something. I don't know. Maybe, you know. But, but anyway, this is, so this is the end of the book of Philippians. We're going to look at the last few verses of the book of Philippians. Philippians, to me, has been a good friend. I, I don't know about to you guys. I'm going to miss it. Uh, you know, people ask me all the time, what's your favorite book in the Bible? And my answer is, whichever one I'm preaching on at the time. I, that's pretty much it, you know. I love all of them, all of them. The whole, every, the Bible says of itself that every word, well, it, it, it actually really goes deeper than that because the Greek word that is used is the word grammata, which means letters of the alphabet. So the word says even the letters of the alphabet that form the words were inspired by God. And it's profitable for instruction and correction and righteousness to straighten people out and help people's lives go forward. That's what God's Word does. And I love every bit of it, really, all the books in there. And, you know, there's some great verses in the Bible that almost everybody remembers. If you, if you grew up in church and you went to vacation Bible school and Sunday school or Bible class, whatever your church might have called it, uh, you probably developed some some memories of certain verses in the Bible that the verses are really important to you. Uh, you memorized them, like, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth him would not perish but have everlasting life, John three sixteen. You probably have that memorized, and you would say, man, that's a great verse. And when, you, and when you're feeling certain ways, you, you might go to that verse in your mind, and, and it will help you to be encouraged and, and, and grow, you know. And verses like, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But God showed his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You know, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. I mean, verses like, you know, verses like that. And I was thinking about some verses in Philippians because this is the last message out of Philippians today. And I got to thinking about the great verses that are in Philippians. I'm talking about verses that I remember and I, they come back to me all the time, and I use them. And, and, it, it, and I just jotted them down so I, I wouldn't forget any of them. But now, just think about this. Philippians is four chapters. Four chapters. So it's not a really big book, and it's not, you know, it, 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 but listen, the, listen to the verses that, that, to me, are some of the great verses of Philippians, where Paul says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. That's a good word, isn't it? I think about that sometimes in connection with, with the church. You know, God, man, I thank God. Every time I think about you, I thank God. And that's a great word to us. Uh, being confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in us would keep performing it until the day of Christ. That verse says that if you've given your heart to Christ, you've given your life to Christ, he's not going to let you go. He's never going to let you go. He's never going to let you down. He's going to keep on working until the day of Jesus Christ, until the day you're called home to be with the Lord or the day the Lord comes after you. 
Jesus is going to keep working in your life if you've given. He's not going to throw you away. You're not going to run away from him. He can run faster than you. I mean, that's just a great thought. And then, of course, who could forget for me to live as Christ and to die as gain? It comes out of Philippians. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. That's Philippians 2. But what things were gained to me, I counted them all lost for the cause of Christ. Forgetting those things which are behind and pressing toward those things which are before me, I press toward the mark of the high calling of God in Jesus Christ. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. These are all in Philippians. And of course, to me, the greatest of all, and my God shall supply all your need according to his riches which are by Christ Jesus. Those are all in Philippians. Man, you're talking about an inspirational word for our lives and some help and some support when you struggle in life, man. Grab on to, grab on to the Philippians. You could read the whole book in just a few minutes, I'll guarantee you, and God's going to speak to your voice. That, that, and, and my God shall supply all of your needs. And my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory, by Christ Jesus. That has, to be, that has to be the greatest promise in the entire word of God because it's so all-encompassing. I mean, it includes every other promise, right? I mean, my God shall supply all of your needs. What kind of need do you have? Do you need healing? Do you need health? Do you need life? Do you need relationships? Do you need a job? Do you need uh, uh, mental awareness? Do you? I mean, what is it you need in life? Because anything that you need in life will fit into Philippians 4.19, and my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And then I get to thinking, well, why aren't, why aren't all of, why aren't everybody's needs being met? I know some people that whose needs aren't being met. Even Christians, I know some Christians whose needs aren't being met. And so I'm thinking, is God telling us the truth here? Or has somehow this promise been invalidated? It's not good anymore. Like God went out of business or something. The warehouses are empty. There's no more food in the cupboard for God. And then I came to the real truth of this thing. This promise is not for everybody. Hello? Look at your neighbor and say, I hope he's not talking to you. <laughs> okay? Okay? I'm just saying this promise is not for everyone. And here's why. Because this promise is conditional. Do you see? I mean, I've already trained you, I'm sure enough, that you, the first thing that you thought about when I said, and my God shall supply, is you thought, you know, that begins with a conjunction. That begins with and, A and D. Now, what, does, what do conjunctions do? They connect things, right? Okay, so the verse begins with and. So that means this verse is connected to something, right? So what is it connected to? Well, let, I tell you what, let's just do. I, let's just look at what it's connected to just real quick now. I've I'm, I'm, I got, I got some points for you. You see them on the outline. But let's just read the verses here real quick. Nevertheless, nevertheless, you have done well that you have shared in my distress. Obviously, Paul's saying, thank you for taking care of me while I've had nothing. That's what he said. I've, I've been in distress, and you, you have taken care of me. Now, you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving but you only. This little church in Philippi is the only church. Paul said, when I first started carrying the gospel to the world, no church anywhere mm -hmm. helped me try to pay the expenses and, and get the stuff together and, and get the gospel going. I mean, man, look, this was the beginning of the gospel. 
going to the world so that you and I could be sitting here 2,000 years later having the gospel and preaching the gospel and having the gospel in our hearts and going to heaven when we die and Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. I mean, this was a pivotal, pivotal thing. And Paul said, no, no, church, no church cared about the gospel moving forward. No church tried to uh, say, can I help you? You need anything? Uh, uh, let me get you a boat. Uh, you know, I mean, there was no internet. There were no cameras flashing. I mean, what I'm saying right now is going everywhere, all over the world, anywhere in the world, somebody clicks in. They can hear what I'm saying, see what I'm doing, and all of that kind of stuff. But there was none of that back then. There was no, there was no uh, automobiles, airplanes, jet trips. There was none of that kind of stuff. There was no, you know, Twitters and Facebooks. And, I mean, you had to go physically face to face and carry the gospel with you. You had to get on a boat and go across the ocean and go to another land and, and, and deal with people that spoke a different language and had a different culture and did different things and didn't like you and looked suspicious at you. You had to build relationships and develop relationships with people and, 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 and work for a living and then minister to them and talk to them and encourage them that this is the truth and this is what God says. And the Holy Spirit was just pounding that into them as you were sharing, making them sense that there was something special. And Paul said, no church help me except you. And you ought to be, a, you know, put on the mountaintop somewhere. You ought to be applauded. You ought to be, man, you are a wonderful, great, dynamic group of people. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once, not just once, and again. You, you sent it once, and then you sent it again for my necessities. Paul was in Thessalonica for one year. One year, Paul was in Thessalonica, and these Philippians in one year sent two separate offerings to him to help support the work. And remember, you couldn't make a transfer over the internet. You couldn't give them a credit card and say, use my number. You couldn't you know, use some of these other uh, transfer funds. And so, I mean, you had to actually physically, manually get up off of your couch and get somewhere and then convince the people that they needed money and, give, and convince the people to give money to something they don't even know about, to somebody they don't know who's ministering this strange new teaching called the gospel. And then you had to take it and you had to carry it about four or 500 miles or so, get on a boat, be out there in the weather and the storm and the wind and the bugs and the violence and the everything else. And you carry in this little, you know, rolled up a uh, little bit of money and you know, you're going to give it to the apostle Paul and said, here, I, I don't know if what you need, but, but use this for yeah. what you need. You know, I mean, you need some food or you need some, something to ride on. I mean, you know, uh, here, use that. And then they sent Epaphroditus, and you'll see it in just a second. They not only sent money, they sent somebody. They said, I'm, we're sending Epaphroditus down there to help you just in case you need somebody to pick up something and move something and hold something and, and go out and round up the people and, and carry something and help you get on the boats and help you get off the boats and help you uh, keep people's attention and attraction. And, and, you know, and heaven knows if somebody wants to attack you, you at least got one other person with you that might could help you keep from being killed or something. I mean, this is the real deal, man. This is the real stuff. This is not happy church sitting in padded seats with air conditioner running. This is real life. And the Apostle Paul says, my Lord, you guys are something unique. You are so special. And he's, and, and he's, and he's just pouring out his, his, his love and his, and his goodwill and his good word to people who had sacrificially given to him, who had, who had gone above and beyond the measure of making sure that somebody else in life was blessed besides themselves. Mm -hmm. Then he says, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. We'll talk about that in a minute. Paul said, I'm not saying this to you because I want some more money. I'm in prison, man. They figured to cut my head off. What do I need money for? I'm just telling you so that you can know that your heavenly bank account has just gone forward. Indeed, I have all and I abound and I'm full. 
Why are you full, Paul? Because you Philippians sent Epaphroditus, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you. And look how he describes them. A sweet-smelling aroma. What does that make you think about? That makes me think about those offerings that were given to God in the Old Testament where they, where they broke the vials and they poured the perfume and then on Jesus' feet when they poured it and the essence of that thing just rose up and, and, and Paul is saying, man, the nostrils of God are smelling your offering. What you gave is a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. I will talk about it. I didn't got all off. And... And my God shall supply all of your need. Not everybody else's. Not those other people that are laying at their house on the couch watching the football game with a bag of corn chips on their stomach. Not those people that aren't out here uh, caring about the gospel and tending to the things of God. Not those people that care more about themselves than anything else in life. Not those people that have not one generous bone in their body. Not one person do they ever think about except their own personal needs. But God is going to supply your needs because of your sacrificial giving and your generosity toward people who are in need. This might shock you, and I, I, I know I say this, and if I have any theologues watching uh, you know, they may jump up and down on this, but this is the absolute truth. I mean, I'm going to tell you, I'm, I'm 60, almost 62 years old, and, um, and, and the Lord's been good to me, and I, I've been through a lot of stuff, and I've been in a lot of ministry, and I'm going to tell you the truth. In your Bible, all of the stuff that you read in the New Testament about giving, every bit of it, you lump it all together, every verse that says anything about giving, and you will find that about 90% of them, 9 out of 10, I just clicked it over there. Let me get here. About 9 out of 10 verses in the New Testament about giving are about us Christians giving to poor people, to people who are needy, to people who don't have anything, to people that work hard because if the Bible says if you don't work, you don't eat. We're not talking about lazy people that won't work. We're talking about people who need, people who are hardworking, people who are trying, people who are struggling, People who, are, people who love God and are walking and people that want to do better and have children and have families and they're struggling to make the ends meet. And, they, and, and, and God says, have compassion on these people. Take up your offerings. Take care of their needs. Make sure that they have their needs met. About 90% of the verses that talk about giving are not talking about tithing. It's talking about giving to people that are poor and needy and struggling and hurting in life, being generous to other people. And the other 10% are about taking care of people who preach the gospel. I'm, I mean, I'm serious about that. I, I know it sounds a little self-serving, but I'm just telling you, there are only two things the New Testament talks about giving for, poor people and the people ministering the gospel. That's the only two things that it says you do with your money. Doesn't say anything about building buildings and having carpet and, you know, sound and light. I mean, it doesn't say anything about all the stuff we do with money that people give. And I know, and I'm not trying to say we need to stand out in the parking lot somewhere. I mean, we got to have a place to meet. So we do have to spend money on something besides poor people and preachers. But that's all the Bible talks about. And here's the Apostle Paul saying to a church in Philippi, and this is a poor church. This is not a rich church. This is a bunch of poor people, man. These people work blue collar, hard working. They don't have a big, this is not a big elaborate fancy synagogue somewhere. This is a little old church like us. Takes up our offering 
tries to make ends meet, pays the power bill, tries to rent a little building, pay a little electricity so we can see in here and have a little bit of comfort. We, 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 we buy stuff that, that, that we can minister the gospel with, and a lot of the people that do the stuff up here buy the stuff up here. I mean, you got a pastor that works for a living, so I don't have to take inordinate amounts of money out of the treasury of the church to pay a salary so I can keep my house and my power bill and drive a car around. Poor people, working people, people that didn't have a lot of extra stuff, and yet they took some of the stuff that they had voluntarily. I know a lot of people say, man, that sounds like communism. No, it doesn't. Communism is when the state takes it away from you, whether you want to or not. What I'm talking about is you giving what you want to do. You make the decision. It's your stuff, not the government stuff. It's your stuff, and God is saying that he wants you to have a heart that wants to take your stuff and make sure that other people have things that they need in life. And that's what Paul is saying when he's, and then he says, now if that's you, then God's going to supply all of your needs. You can count on God, buddy. God's got your back. And I'll guarantee you, I could name five, at least five or six people right now in this church. I could point them out. They're sitting in this sanctuary. And maybe a couple are, are gone today, but, but. I, can, I could point you out if it wouldn't embarrass you, and I'm not going to do it, so relax. I, I do know how to keep my mouth shut on some things, all right? But, but I, I mean, you are living examples of this. There is no reason you are making it. There, there is no reason that you could have what you have and do what you do. There's, just, there's no explanation for it whatsoever. I mean, as, as, if, if, if we looked at your books and we looked at your life and we looked at your bills and we looked at your payments and we looked at how much money's coming in, how much going out, we would say, man, you've been bankrupt for the last 10 years. And yet, and yet, you keep coming, you keep smiling, you keep giving, you keep looking for people that can help. I tell you what, we have some people in our church that can barely afford gas to make it here. They work hard. Yeah. They go to work every day. Yeah. They tithe. They give. They, I've even seen them be generous with the little old scrappings of money they have, which is almost nothing, man. They said, here, take this. And, you, and I'm thinking to myself, when I'm seeing them, I'm going, oh, my God, what are you going to do about gas the rest of the week? Yeah. That's what I'm thinking. And yet, here they go. Booming right along, giving every time it needs to be given. Uh, got nice things, drive automobiles, get a new one every now and then. Uh, you know, have resources, got a, a nice place to live. And I'm, and I'm looking and I'm saying, how is that happening? And the P and my God shall supply all of your need. That's how that's happening. That's what that promise is about. It's about people who are generous. It's about people who are sacrificial, yeah, yeah. like the Philippians were to the Apostle Paul. That's not just a promise to every, you know, uh, Sam, Sue, and Harry. Yeah. <laughs> Mary, either one. Yeah. That is a promise. That is a, that is a conditional promise. You know what promise is? A conditional promise says there's a premise and there's a promise. And if you meet the premise, you get the promise. If you don't meet the premise, you ain't getting the promise. So quit trying to claim the promise. Man, I have heard so many sermons from those prosperity boys. I'm, I mean, it just, just, Lord help me, don't blow me up. Don't blow me up right now. Calm me down. But I've heard so many sermons about about sacrificially giving and passing the offering and writing down what you want from God and, 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 and give and give and he'll give you a hundredfold and he'll give you a thousandfold and he'll give, and I mean all of these things and they talk about, you know what they're talking about? Give money to their self 
so that they can get another jet and another mansion and 50 more acres of land somewhere where you don't know where they are, so you'll think they're holy and they're a bunch of outlaws. I mean, the Bible said that they were, they, that, that, that they were enemies of the cross of Jesus Christ. If you think I'm being mean to them, look what the Bible says about them. People who care only about themselves and take care and take advantage of the poor, innocent people that are trying to receive the gospel and receive and learn, and you teaching them stuff uh, for your own, to take advantage of these people and to, for your own benefit. What are you, an enemy of the cross of Christ? You're an indictment against the kingdom of God. You're the reason people look at us and say, man, those preachers ain't nothing but a bunch of charlatans. And they're right about 99% of the time because we've been infested with such a spirit of greed and, and a spirit of, uh, of selfishness. This verse is not promising to bless some lazy somebody that sits somewhere and says, I'm just waiting on the Lord. Yeah. No, you're not. You're lazy. Get off your backside. God's not going and, to, and, and God's not, and God's going to supply all my needs. No, he's not. You're going to have to get out there and beg, which is what you do and call it waiting on the Lord. Yeah. I mean, do you, do you, do you catch this? And I, and, and I'm saying, I'm saying, a church like us, a church that is, how do we do what we do? How do we have what we have? Seriously, how do we do, how does this happen? And my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory. You know what Bell told me uh, right toward the first few months that we were at church. I preached a message. I preached a message. She's a killer bee. I can talk about her. The, I preached a message. I preached a message about, about uh, the widow and when she made Elijah the, the cake and, and all that and then she, she didn't have but enough meal to make one cake and enough oil and and, and she said, I'm going to make a cake for my boy and me, and we're going to eat it, and then we're going to die because we have nothing else to eat. And I just said, uh, make me one first. Now, that seems mighty arrogant, right? But all that was was an opportunity for her to put God first in her life. So Elijah said, will you put God first in your life? Make me one of those cakes. And she made one of those cakes for him, and she went back to her pot, and her pot never ran dry. Now, it never ran over either. <laughs> so in other words, it didn't just flow out the top, and you could look at it and say, oh, we've got plenty. No, no, you couldn't see the plenty. You just had to go over there, and, but when you put your hand in, your hand picked up something in the pot. And Beverly looked at me and said, that's what God says to you, Pastor. Whatever you need, whatever you need, just put your hand in the pot and it'll be there. And I'm going to tell you what, that has happened every single time that I have put my hand in that pot. God has supplied the need. It is unbelievable what has happened. And some of those people that I was talking about where I don't know how they're doing what they're doing are some of the people that keep supplying the pot, and I don't know how they keep supplying the pot, except, and my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory. And we give to Kosovo. We just started doing that, a church there. So we're outside our own boundaries. We give money to the flood victims. We, I mean, we, we can't give exorbitant amounts of money because we, we don't have exorbitant amounts of money. But we, in our need, in our, in our, in our, in our, our uh, poverty, so to speak, in our, in our little bit of stuff, we take a little, we take some of our stuff that we could use on something else, and we get it to them so they can have a building to meet in over there and, and have a place where other Christians can come to the Lord. I mean, we're not some giant mausoleum somewhere with hundreds of thousands of dollars laying around on, in every corner. 
And that's what Paul is saying. He's saying, look, you can literally stop the flow of God in your life. How can you do that? By being stingy. So the premise is that I've got to use my resources and I've got to consider my resources. Listen, let me just say this to you. I know that a lot of people, they, they think tithing is simply an Old Testament thing. And they say, you know, the Old Testament, God said, give me, give me 10%, blah, blah. Well, in Corinthians, Paul says, bring a percentage of your, of your stuff down to, the, down to the storehouse every week. As, and here's the phrase, as God has blessed you. That's teaching percentage giving. But, but let's just get off of that for just a second. Even if, even if that wasn't, what we do, he's talking about the people of God who pray, seek God, and look for needs that they can help meet. Ask God, not just willy-nilly throwing money out there and saying, okay, it's going to be blessed. No, no, no. You better make sure God's leading you to do this. And then instead of buying four pair of blue jeans, you buy three and you take the other 30 bucks or 50 bucks or however much jeans cost that you buy and you, and you help somebody buy gas to come to church for the next week or two. That's, that's what he's talking about. He's talking about generosity. He's not talking about giving money to the church. He's talking about being generous with others who have legitimate needs that need to be met. Man, there are people that work hard. There are people that do everything they can. There are people that, that struggle and, and, and they make ends meet and they're the greatest managers and administrators you've ever seen and yet they still struggle at times. And God says, take care of people like that. Take care of people like yeah. that. You know why the government has to take care of people in our country? Because the churches won't do it. Mm-hmm. It's the church's responsibility to take care of the people, not the government. Mm-hmm. But we're so all fired, blooming, stingy, we won't take care of anybody else. All right. You know, I'm going to say this. I've, I've just done, I've, I've messed all my outline all up. <laughs> Come on. I'll just have to go through at the end and tell you the words. I got my mic all messed up. But, 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 in, but you know, the, um, I'm, I'm trying to figure a way to say this uh, as gently as I can. But, but just, you know, when God, God inspires us to give and to, and, and to look at the needs of, of other people and to take care of the needs of somebody else, I think about that in connection with some with some con, a concept that I have heard all of my adult Christian life. It came along in probably about the I'd say the the late eighties, early nineties. This concept kind of made its real growth, and that was that um, in the New Testament church. The church proved that it was from God because many signs and wonders were done in the church. And you read the book of Acts, you read some of the letters, and you'll see that in many of the early churches that there were miracles and signs and wonders and so forth. Now, follow me for a second. You know, just indulge me for a second here. Now, when, when you think about that, when, you, when somebody says to you, well, do they do signs and wonders in your church? What do you think they're asking? You think, okay, do they heal people? Do they uh, raise the dead? Do they walk on water? You know, that's one I've never seen duplicate. I've never seen anybody. Do they walk on water? Do they, you know, do they take a little sardine and feed 5,000 people with it, you know? I mean, when you hear the word signs and wonders happened in the early church, you think, like me, I'm sure, 
you start thinking of these big dynamic miracle things like, you know, like Lazarus come forth, you know, kind of stuff, you know. Could it be? I mean, just think about it this way. I mean, for, for a human, uh, self-loving, uh, money-loving, materialistic, uh, self-centered, self-focused person, to actually take some of his stuff and sell it and then come and find a person that he, that, that he might not even know real well and, and share his stuff with them. Is that not one of the greatest signs and wonders that you would ever see in life? I'm telling you, that would be a miracle right there. And I know you're sitting there going, oh, I don't know about that. Well, when's the last time you saw it happen? That somebody that had the biggest house, the biggest mansions, the most money, had everything made, had all the finances they wanted, and said in their heart that they love the Lord, take some of their stuff and give it to somebody else who is in need. I'm telling you, that would be a miracle. That would be a sign and wonder right there that fills the early church or any church. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I want to I'm gonna carry forward because I've got, I got to quit because the saints are playing today. Um, <laughs> all right, now this right here is just the closing verses and I put them up here because these are the last verses and I didn't want to quit without showing you the last verses. Now, I might not be through talking about what I've been talking about, but just hang with me. Now, now, look at what he says. Now, to our God and Father, be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren who are with me greet you. Uh, all the saints greet you, but especially those who are of Caesar's household. In other words, there have been some of Caesar's household, one to the Lord. There are actually some Christians now in Caesar's household. And they say, hey, you know, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And that's Paul's letter to the Philippians, those bad Philippians. The premise, I must be generous with others. Give you a couple of parallel verses. Here they are right here. The generous soul will be made rich, and he who waters will also himself be watered. And what is that verse saying? Do I need to give you that in Greek? That's pretty clear in English, isn't it? You're going to be generous. You're going to be made rich. Oh, hot dog, man. I'm going to be rich. Well, you might not have any money. There's a lot of things you can be rich in. Let me ask you, what could be richer than your health? I guarantee you there are people with billions of dollars that would give all of it if they had a good heart or if they had uh, uh, cancer out of their body or they had that brain tumor gone. I'm telling you, there are lots of ways to be rich. What about your family? Do you have to go get your kids out of jail? That's, that's great, man. I, you, say, you say, well, that ain't. Well, yeah, because ask these ones that do have to go get them out of jail. And they say, my Lord, that would be the greatest thing on the face of this earth. I mean, do, are they rebellious? Do, are they polite? Are they generous? Do they help you with a house? And they, I mean, that's rich, man. You live in a place that's adequate. You don't have to go home and fight bugs and when you step on the floor, it falls through and all that kind of stuff. Man, there are lots of ways to be rich. The generous soul will be made rich and he who waters will also be watered himself. What does that imply? You don't water, you ain't getting any water. Give, look at this in Luke. I mean, this is not, we, we get so deep in the Greek nowadays and the Latin and all that kind of stuff. What, look at this. Do you need any of that for this? Give and it'll be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over will be put into your bosom for with the same measure that you use, it'll be measured back to you. You take a little eyedropper and measure out your generosity and God's gonna take a little eyedropper and drop a little bit back in your life. You take, a, you take a forklift front-end loader and load it in somebody else's life, and God's going to take a front-end loader and load it into your life. Yeah, yeah. You determine the size and the source of your own blessing. 
In order to be blessed, I must be generous. A generous soul. Now, let me go on. All right. Three reasons to be generous. These are your blanks. My giving is an encouragement to others. Why, why should I be generous? Because when I'm generous, it encourages others to be generous. Number one, one reason. When other people see me being generous, they look at themselves and say, man, I don't, I don't ever do anything like that. The Apostle Paul, you know, looked at them and said, for even in Thessalonica, Thessalonica, you sent me aid once and again for all my necessities. In other words, the Apostle Paul looked at them and said, you know what? When I first started this thing, boy, nobody encouraged me. Nobody gave me a good word. Nobody gave me any resources. Nobody said anything to me about anything. And all of a sudden, you guys sent me a couple of offerings and said, we're with you, Paul. Here, take these resources. You might need something. Buy you a coat, something. It might be cold up there. And we'll take care of this and take this to the gospel. And we're praying for you. And we're not only praying for you. Man, people say it all the time. I'm praying for you. Yeah. Man, I mean, I'm, I'm glad you're praying for me. But how about a little bit of, how about a little bit of resources here? I mean, prayers only go so far. I believe in prayer. I don't get me wrong. Don't say, Pastor, don't believe in prayer. But, I, you know, if I have a need, man, I have a need. So praying for me is a good thing. But how about, how about a little bit of trying to meet this need I got going on in my life? And the Apostle Paul said, man, when you started doing that, it just fired me up. Man, it encouraged me. That's what he said. And so whenever I give to the needs of others, it's an encouragement. Not only to them, I mean, listen to this. Have you ever received something from someone that was an encouragement to you? Yeah. When you got it, it just encouraged you. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Have you ever given something to someone that you knew was an encouragement to them? All right. So what does that mean? That means that both the giver and the receiver are blessed when we give, like God says give. So one of the reasons to be generous is it encourages others, and it blesses you too, both the giver and the receiver. Yeah, all right, let me go. Number two, my giving is an investment for the future. See, we're always looking for investments, right? You got 401ks, you got Roth 401, you got retirement plans, you got annuities, you have all this kind of stuff. For, for the future now, for the future. Paul says, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Mm -hmm. Now, I know Linda, you know, Linda's, Linda Fowler uh, is associated with the bank, and I know she's not the investment person and all that, but let's just use her because we know her name. <laughs> she's at the bank, and we know her name. I mean, she's really retired, but they draw her back every now and then because she's so good at what she does. But anyway, the, uh, let's say we went down to the bank and we walked in there to Linda and we said, hey, Linda, um, how much interest have I drawn? What would be her first question? Well, how much money have you put in? And then you say, well, I hadn't put any money in. And what's her next <laughs> remark going to be? Uh, let me let you in on a little secret here. If you don't put any money in, there is no interest on your money. And let me put it in an easier way. Zero in equals zero out. If you're going to invest, if you're going to have resources for the future, you got to put some stuff in. And the Apostle Paul says, when you give generously, Man, you are investing in your heavenly bank account. And let me tell you something. The bank of heaven is not going to run dry. It's not going to run. You know how I know that? Look at the miracles of Jesus. The miracles of Jesus are the, the feeding of the 5,000. Fed 5,000 people, five loaves, two fishes. Had how many basketfuls left? Twelve basketfuls left. Had 12 take-home boxes left. In other words, one for every single one of those disciples that said, I don't think this is going to work. What's he going to do with five loaves and two fishes? Oh, my goodness, this is going to be bad. They're going to revolt on him. 
He said, here, take you a big doggy bag home for your unbelief and take you a big one for yours and take you a big one for yours. I got one for every one of you doubters. Proof that what? The kingdom of God has way more resources than we would ever use or need. So the bank of heaven is not going dry and God has all of the resources that we need in our lives. And he said, you want to get some of it? You got to invest some stuff in it. All right, here we go. Oh, and everyone who's left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold. Talk about some, there's some interest for you. How much do you get off your bank accounts? Uh, 0.2%, 0.1%. A zero, negative two. <laughs> you know, that's about what it is nowadays. He said, I'm going to give you a hundred times. If, if you leave your houses, your brothers, your sisters, your mother, your father, your wife, your children, land, for my name's sake, boy, you care about other people. You care about what happens in other people's lives. You're looking for a way to bless somebody else. I'm going to make sure you're blessed and you're going to inherit eternal life. Let them do good that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. In other words, he's saying, you want to to lay up treasures for heaven? You got to start laying them up now. This is where the treasures of heaven come from. You say, what what are we going to have in heaven? I'm going to have a mansion in heaven. No, you're going to have a little tiny shack on the back corner back there somewhere because you hadn't sent any building materials up to build a mansion with. You say, man, I'm going to have all these crowns to give. No, 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 no. Those crowns come from people who have sacrificed. You got one little crown. It's called the crown of life. Everybody has the crown of life. There's five of them mentioned in the Bible. Everybody has the crown of life. That's the one where people get it when they say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. Be my Savior. That's the crown of life. You got one little crown up there. But people who have sacrificed, people who have been martyred, people who have gone and preached the gospel, people who cared, they get other crowns. You know, the martyr's crown, the uh, crown of rejoicing. The crown, I mean, and then they got like five crowns. When Jesus walked by, boy, they, all five of them just hit the ground in front of Jesus. So store up. But Paul says, you got, if you want to have stuff when you get to heaven, you got to start storing it up right. Why should I be generous? Because it encourages everybody else to be generous. And I'm storing up... A, a future a reward for my life. Number three, my sacrifice, my giving is a sacrifice to God. I'm quitting y'all really in a minute, just a minute. <laughs> I'm going to say like Paul, finally. Uh, my giving is a sacrifice to God. All right, this will be quick. All right, notice verse 18. Indeed, I have all, I have all and abound. Got all I need. I'm doing well. Don't need anything. I'm not asking you for anything. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things that 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 you sent that sent from you, a sweet smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well pleasing to God. All right. Have you ever thought or or said, I wonder what it is that pleases God. I wonder if my life is pleasing God. Huh? Bless you, baby. I wonder if my life is pleasing God. Well, if you want to know what pleases God, there it is. Right there. Greek, Hebrew, Latin, whatever language you want to put it in. There it is right there. That's what pleases God. You sacrificially giving yourself or giving of your resources or giving of your life. That's what pleases God. And notice what Paul says. Paul says, when I give sacrificially, it always pleases God. Why? Why Why would sacrificial giving please God? Because it is giving by faith. You are giving, believing that God's going to bless you with enough to give, That's faith. And believing that what you give is going to bless someone else, that's faith. The book of Hebrews says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. 
Because those that come to God must believe that he is and must believe that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. So when I give by faith, I please God every time. And so the Apostle Paul says here, you know that stuff y'all sent me? Do you know that God took that for himself? <laughs> Do you know that stuff y'all sent me, God took for himself? And you know what it was to him? A sweet smell and aroma and acceptable sight, right? And it just pleased God. So why should I be generous? I should be generous because it encourages everybody around me to be generous. It encourages things to go forward, moving on in the kingdom of God. It builds me a future that, that in heaven one day I'm going to have a tremendous foundation. And in life, God's going to bless me also. And then number three, it is a sacrifice to God. In other words, sacrificial giving, giving by faith, is an act of worship to God. We talk about worship and praise like it's a song. And worship and praise is I honor God. My life is for God. I contribute to God. And, and Paul says, when you, when, I, when you gave me that stuff, God looked at it and said, they love me. He received it as worship. Oh, my goodness, guys. This is, mm, I'm telling you, see, the word is rich, man. Yeah, the word is rich. Word. The promise... And my God, who's going to give it to you? God and my God. The source is my God. Who am I going to count on to return my investment? My God. And does he have stuff? Yep. Does he have all I need? Yep. Then the scope. How big is this thing? And my God shall supply all. Not just some, but all. Not all you want. You know, Christmas and Thanksgiving are coming, right? You say, what's the difference between needing a want? Well, Christmas and Thanksgiving are coming. Well, when I walk in at Thanksgiving at somebody's house or walk in at Christmas and there's all these little goodies and snacks and these little things, I want, <laughs> I want every one of them. I don't need any of them, though. <laughs> there you go. So God said, I'm going to supply all your needs, man. What kind of need? Spiritual needs, emotional needs, relational needs, financial needs, family needs, life needs. I mean, just what need do you have? All. He's going to supply all of your needs according to the And here's the supply. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory. By Christ Jesus. Let me just boil this one little thought down. I tried to share this with Tanya. She was completely underwhelmed. I'm going to share it with you, and you are probably going to be completely underwhelmed also. But I'm going to tell you, to the mind of a theologian, this is a real big thought, okay? It just shows you how bored theology is most of the time. This verse says that God is going to meet our need according to to his riches and glory. It doesn't say by his riches and glory. See, this is straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel, but hang with me one second. What's the difference between according to his riches and by his riches? All right, I, got, I thought about it. I said, let me think if I could get this. All right, uh, you guys know about Sam Walton, right? Owner of Walmart, billionaire. If you don't like him, think about Bill Gates, billionaire. You know, all right. Sam Walton lost a billion dollars in one day in the stock market. A billion dollars. Do you know what his comment was? It's only paper. That's what he said. It's only paper. So if Sam Walton walked up to you and had a check in his hand for a certain amount of money. And he said, here you go. I want you to meet that need that you have. That would be giving by his riches. If he walked up to you and handed you a check and said, hey, I've signed that. Uh, there's no amount there. Just get whatever you need. That would be giving according to his riches. A lot of difference in those two. May not, you may be underwhelmed, but to me there's a lot of difference. How many of you see the difference? 
Okay, you can go, you can go, you can go, you can go, you can go. The rest of you stay right here. I got some more preaching to you. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. All right, stand here.